part of our uh, inside outside library if you want to go outside then of course you need to share your uh, your um, data and you uh, please do this in a format that everyone can uh, can uh, read and understand well rubric is really the export on how to uh, to change all your data into uh, uh, data that everyone can can understand because he's a language expert he he speaks every language in the world, including Python, Java, RDF, Linked Data, RDI, uh, Sparkle, and what, the and what have you. So it's yours. Like that. OK, yeah. Um, obviously, I'm not very good with technology. Um, it's one of those things. Um, yeah, I don't know whether all you said is true, um, but I have a penchant for doing things with both language and uh, programming languages, uh, but I'm mostly interested in the structure and not the semantics. Anyway, um, I have a title uh, with the word write in it. Fortunately, the word write is in inverted commas, so uh, it doesn't mean write for everyone, but hopefully right for some of us. Uh, but I'm talking about future-proof library content, and here we have some library content. The clock that's all wrapped up, well, this is future-proof in a way. It's time and it's wrapped up in plastic. Uh, we're painting at the moment. And then we have some high-proof library content. And then we have some uh, lovely uh, semantic web stuff. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is a particularly, perhaps, it's a little bit more navel gazy than the things that have been said hitherto. Um, it fits more in with the category of presentations that we had yesterday from uh, Sven and uh, Joachim. And in fact, I'm talking pretty much about the same kind of thing. Um, so I hope I don't repeat too much. Okay. Um, about us. I work at NTNU University Library. It's a science and technology library. But at the moment, I'm seconded to a uh, group of people that work with special collections. Uh, we have various uh, items from the museum world, but we work with archives and uh, images, all kinds of stuff. Um, I myself uh, moved to Norway in, yeah, well, 15 years ago. and. Moving to a foreign country, it's difficult to get a job. However, I was given the opportunity to uh, go in as an IT person in a very small print shop on the proviso that I was also a, um, uh, what are they called, a laling? What's the word for that? I've just, it's slipped out of my mind. A, an apprentice uh, within pre-printing, pre-press. And at that time, everything had moved over from Quark to Adobe. And Adobe started doing stuff with metadata, embedded metadata, which happened to be in this new format called RDF. And from that, I started working with RDF. And through a s series of jobs, I actually worked with the print pre-press world and actually working with RDF pretty much every day, uh, using it to control our workflows. And I worked actually more with programming workflows than anything else, because lots of the stuff you do in a print shop is very machine-oriented. It's very mechanistic. Anyway, about us otherwise, well, we're a bunch of extremists. Uh, we've marked everything up with one license for data, and that's ODC PDDL. Anyone that heard my outburst yesterday will understand that I'm passionate about that. Um, also, we have uh, all of our assets licensed CC by SA um, for all of the understandable reasons. But also, we're moving towards RDF as our sole format, um, both for yeah, the typical library content, the archives, and stuff like that. Um, otherwise, yeah, we're a group of people. On the uh, uh, left, we have a, uh, an engineer, an electrical engineer. Uh, myself, I'm a linguist. We have a technician and a bookbinder holding a piece of a ski lift. Um, none of us are librarians, actually. And this is the thing. It's, yeah. 
it's kind of a, an odd situation we have. But anyway, I personally have had a really interesting journey working with this stuff. It's been really quite different for me. Uh, and I've really appreciate working, appreciated working with this. Um, moving from a scripter to more of a sort of hacker type person um, and getting the chance to work with software architecture and planning things. And yeah, I'll tell you a bit of the story related to this. One of the managers one day came to me and said this. Could you raise your hand if it makes you cry a little bit that it says web page? Web page. Yeah, I know what you mean, but I also know what you think. Fortunately, we've got to the stage where the majority of our managers understand that there's a difference between a page you make in Dreamweaver and an actual functioning thing on the web. Um, for us, it's a bit of an uphill struggle at times, but I, I think we're getting there, yeah. What we analyzed from this statement was that we need a way, a new way of presenting our assets to users um, because we weren't particularly satisfied with the product we were providing uh, to our users. And it's the whole thing of asset production, ingesting these assets into a workflow where they can be documented, preserved digitally, stored, and then provided to our users. So we had a quick analysis and a very simple capability stack was developed. How many people are familiar with capability stacks? No one. Right, I worked in the oil industry for about two weeks, and this is a term from there. Well, okay, 10 months, but anyway. Uh, doing linked data, interestingly enough. But anyway, we have the things we need to do. And this is, yeah, I'll say in a minute about the technology stack, but it contrasts quite easily. But you'll notice there are actually only four things there. It's the thing of addressing, which basically is you need to be able to get hold of the thing that you're interested in. Um, actually providing data about that thing, linking up to the resource itself, and being able to search in these things. Um, now that sounds like you could have a, a nice web app that did all of those things with a nice search interface on the top. Um, you'll notice I have a pretty Dadaistic uh, approach to slides. I am not very good at making PowerPoints, so I just add comments in. So if you're bored, read the comments on there, if not, listen to me. Anyway, um, so it's this process of moving away from this idea of a web app to actually being part of the web. And I think the thing that says most about this is there's a, some companies that talk about web scale. And if you, does anyone know what web scale actually means? It means at the scale of the web. Is there anything else like the web that is at the scale of the web? No. So. I answer, it was a rhetorical question, I'm sorry. So if you've got a bit of a crappy database and you're not exposing every single line in that database to the web, you aren't web scale. You actually have to be part of the web to be web scale. So for us, this meant using HTTP as a thing. And it means using standard web technologies otherwise that we can use as modules in our system. And I've written here, so it must be true, not weird library shit. Anyway, I'm going to swear too much, I've noticed. Um, but this thing of being part of the web is hugely important because it does something that you can't do with a system that isn't part of the web. It makes things findable. And it's this addressing thing the HTTP URI that you use to find things. <laughs> so what we needed to do, we thought, was do what serious web companies do. We expose our data, we make it attractive. We make it something that other people will want to consume, will want to present as a result in their hit lists, for example. But we also found that 
in order to produce and provide data, we need to consume data. And this means being like Google, for example, Yandex, the others. So we have this technology stack. We've got HTTP running through everything. At the bottom, we have RDF. I'm an RDF man. I don't really do standard database technology. Uh, we use JSON-LD, RDF XML, and HTML5 as fronts. But then we have this indexer on top. Now, we can simplify this and say that we have some technologies from the Java stack providing all of those things that I mentioned. And then on top, we have Elasticsearch. But equally well, it could be Google, Yandex, or you. We don't care. We're on the web. We're there because we want to provide information to you. And then we have this thing of where we are now and where we want to be. And at my institution, we have a problem because we have an IT policy developed in 2000 and I think two, 2003. And this was at a time when everything was, we need to scale down, we need to outsource, we need to be part of the institution as a whole. And now, 10 years later, we find that perhaps the institutional IT services focus more on technological infrastructures like networks, Wi-Fi, and not on, for example, Z3950, which we seem to be stuck with. Our partners in this have actually, throughout, over time, shown that they expect more from us than we expect of ourselves. So now we're ramping up, in a way, our technological expertise, our competencies. And we're starting to make architectural choices. And it's this thing of saying, yes, we have a Java stack. And the reason for that is that any monkey can deploy a web application in Tomcat. Any Cumbrian Englishman can do it, so it must be possible for you guys, too. The second part of this uh, whole thing is this workflow idea. We have metadata. When we create metadata, we're thinking about giving this to the users and it being something they can use to search and find. Well, actually, this is the backbone of everything we're doing. It's actually what drives the process. Adopting linked data changed the way we looked at metadata. Um, and it's brought it much more to the center of the process. It's, it's carrying what we do. I'll explain this in a second. We have our process here. It starts off at the top left. Our first act was to create a system that would uh, deploy a, or provide a unique identifier. And what's unbelievable is that we didn't have this from before. We have it for library catalogs and library books, but not for the archives, not for the uh, image collections. Do archives have, I'm asking you, yeah. Do archives typically have a way of identifying the very deepest level in a fund? Typically, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's quite embarrassing that we didn't. And I think that this is because we're not an archival institution, but we're dealing with archives anyway. We're doing the, uh, yeah, we're doing the archival stuff very, very wrongly in a way. Yeah. We did have some IDs, but they weren't they were in an external system that we put our data in, and they never actually linked up to our collection in any way. So, yeah. So the first act was providing this unique identifier, and then this begins tying together multiple levels in our process. We take a barcode with this. We scan the barcode. It then sets up the scanner. And this is all done with some horrible scripting. Um, but what that scan does is actually save the person manually entering in some number with human error. It also saves them nine or 10 clicks 
in the interface for the scanner. They're ready to scan and then they just push plus and they can scan each page. So already there, we've changed the process positively. We've removed the element of human error that we'd seen previously, which was a real issue. It also ties it together with the metadata about the item. If we say it's, for example, a, an archive, we know that an archive needs to be, or part of an archive, it, we know that uh, this needs to go via a certain process to end up in a third party system, which is for archives. We need to generate a PDF. We're actually deriving all of these things just from simple metadata. The cataloging gets fed into the data here. This can also say different things. We can make it part of collections automatically. Say that it's from a particular area, a time period, whatever. And we'll have simple ways of managing our data, our assets, via the metadata. We manage transformations, creating PDFs, what we do with the digital originals. We also say where this is to be stored. Of course, our preservation storage is completely separate from our production storage. So we'll have these big old files hidden away on tape, and then we'll have the production stuff optimized for the web. And in the end, all of this ends up on the web. Did that one change? Hang on. Yeah. This uh, actually could be used for ingestion as well. So you could actually take a non-scanned files, but a digital original, if you will, and uh, ingest it into the same process uh, with no real issues. But this is the thing. It's all managed by the idea that metadata, the data we have about the thing we're working with, actually controls this. It's a little bit more than just something like a catalog record. And I think that this is easier to sell to a manager than, yeah, well, if we work on the metadata, it will make it easier to find, because some people need to know that it's 218 and not 306.6. Yeah. OK, uh, I'm going to do a bit of uh, um, yeah, boxer shorts burning. I can't say brow burning. Boxer shorts burning. Um, and it's this thing of discovery. Discovery isn't the web. Discovery isn't the web. It is not of the web. It might be a web page. Yeah? And what we figured out in the end was that the search box, we had, say, 500,000 pages, each of those being a resource. The search page was one of those 500,000 pages, and we should only actually use as much time on that one page as we did on the other. 500,000. And since we're automating everything, it should also just be very quick, simple. We don't have the massive resources of the likes of Google. What we do have is the ability to say, yes, we can manage to find things that we know we own. And that's also a new thing. In many ways, the library catalog is just a thing to find the things we know we own. I don't think very many other people than us ourselves are interested in that. I think the majority of people want to find information, stuff. And this is why Google is popular, whereas perhaps other discovery systems aren't. I'm looking at you. So it's this thing. It's providing content because people want content. Well, not just people. The web wants content. You'll rank highly if you're providing content, and then adding the links to enrich this stuff. OK, I'll rush through the last bit here. Um, documenting, documenting everything. Our data also provides documentation of how we've transformed things so that we can actually repeat the process if we need to. Um, if we take a de-skew of an image, we actually plot which values have been used. Um, our code is documented properly for the first time. That's that move from being a code kiddie to a script kiddie to a hacker, I suppose. Um, everything we do is really documented. Lightweight, but enough, I think. Technology choice is much simpler, and it's this thing that we're, we're no longer afraid of being a little bit custom. 
is not a bad thing because we do have specific challenges where we are. And then, uh, yeah, okay, scripting, it means Unix, actually. But we're saddled with some legacy stuff. We have a Windows XP machine, which is the only machine that can run our scanner. But we can cope with that as well, responsibly. When it came to uh, working with this stuff, it's interesting that just providing simple examples of how this works means that it sort of spreads, it seeds itself throughout the departments. And a simple example was that we have perhaps some issues with the people working with I images because they have a particular notion of how this is to be done and what level of detail. But what we did was implement things that would allow them to create the level of detail, but create an appropriate level of detail. So implementing face detection, for example, allowing them to tag a face. And then we can later on begin to through go back through the back catalog, do face detection and face recognition so we can enrich the data. So rather than saying first person on the left, second person, third person, we can start saying this area in the image represents this individual, and this can also be done automatically. So we had a much higher level of acceptance and take up of this within the departments working with these materials than we'd expected at all. It was much, much easier than we'd expected, and that I'm very, very grateful for. But it is this climate of change that we have now. We're moving away from monolithic systems to something else. And I think it's quite convincing being part of the web rather than part of someone's substructure web, yeah, substructured web. Okay, yeah, moving this to an institutional level. I think that's a bit more difficult. Um, but there is no reason to not do this at every level. And it's this thing, having worked with the various XML formats embedded in various document types um, from the Adobe stack. How many libraries here actually work with PDF-A? the PDF standard for archives. Yeah, two, three, four, that. How many people aren't aware at all about PDFA? Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, just the, the, the small thing that we're not really aware, the, our systems don't necessarily use this stuff. We use it because we think it's appropriate. It makes the files themselves findable if they get lost on the web on their own, which they do. The slow ups, uphill struggle here is that what we're doing is better than the alternative. We're creating a distributed database that's part of the web. With part of the web, that is the database, rather than creating a new monolith. And the takeaways here, this is some Chinese dumplings that are takeaways. I choose a disgusting uh, looking image. They're probably very nice though. The thing that we've done, I think that the most important thing is talk to one another. Actually find out what needs to be done, talk to the people doing the work, find out the best way to create effective, cost-effective appro approaches. Provide data in formats for the web and consume and use the data in the same way that the big players consume and use data. Yeah. And I think the last thing is I'm quite reassured by the fact that I say um, see a movement in the previous talks towards exactly the same kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Rubik. There's, uh, uh, there's time left for one question. So is there one question? If there's no one question, there is one uh, remark for the workshop number two. So, Jane? Yeah. Sorry, hi. Uh, this is just an easy way 